The following content is not intended as a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Welcome, everyone. My name is Marina Sprocky, and I'm the host of Always Another Way podcast. I have a master's in professional counseling, and I'm the Epi Award-winning author of Stop Looking for a Husband, Find the Love of Your Life, and Nasty Divorce, A Kid's Eye View. I write positive divorce advice for the Huff Post, and I'm trained in clinical hypnosis. And this podcast is for out-of-the-box thinkers, and it's for those who hear the call of hope in always another way. And if you're very rigid and set in your beliefs, this is probably not your cup of tea. However, you should note, taste can and do change. And I just want to thank everybody who listens to this podcast. We are on episode number 97 today, which means I will now have 97 amazing guests with inspiring stories on a variety of topics in the mind, body, spirit, and education genre. I also bring a voice to hush issues like domestic violence and racism. And as you know, if you've listened to this podcast before, I'm a very voracious reader. I read lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of books. And um, there are a few that just definitely stand out, which are books that I reread again because the information is just so good. And I have the author of one of those books on today. But as far as relationships go, I think there are two books that are essential for anybody in a relationship library. And the first one is called, Why Does He Do That? by Lundy Bancroft. Uh, this is for women, because if you are a woman, you are more likely to be killed by your domestic partner than by anybody else. Domestic violence is an epidemic of ridiculous proportions, and it is not talked about enough. So if you are, think you are in any type of relationship where you just don't feel right, whether or not you are being physically abused or not, um, you can go to thehotline.org, and I highly recommend reading this book, Why Does He Do That?, by Lundy Bancroft. And the second book, which isn't quite so um, scary as that one, is called How to Avoid Falling in Love with a Jerk by John Van Epp. And Jerk is genderless in this book, FYI. And this is a book that I think everybody who's going to be in any kind of relationship needs to read. It is so good with amazing information that you just don't get. Um, you know, if you're a parent, you know there's no handbook you get when you have children. And depending on the type of parents you have, well, that also depends on what you saw modeled and what kind of information you get. But I am lucky enough to have the author of How to Avoid Falling in Love with a Jerk on the podcast today. Dr. John Van Epp is a therapist and former adjunct professor, author, lecturer, and is the president and founder of Love Thinks LLC, LCC. It's an organization dedicated to the development of resources that promote healthy individuals and relationships. Dr. Van Epp's evidence-based relationship programs were developed from the combination of his 25 years of clinical counseling in his private practice, of his previous position as founding pastor of a non-denominational church, and of his extensive reviews of research in premarital, premarital, marital, and family relations from the teaching graduate marriage and family coursework as an adjunct professor. So welcome to the show, Dr. Vanna. There you go. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, I am so excited. I just like, I love this book so much. I mean... Just like reading it, I was like, oh, wish I knew that. Wish I knew that. And then, oh, that makes sense. So good. <laughs> we just found, you know, kind of people getting lost in relationships so often. And, um, you know, the starting point of it all is what we call the head and the heart are meant to work together. And people are supposed to use their head. They're supposed to think about things and have thoughts and judgment and good discernment and all of that stuff. And that's supposed to blend with how we bond with people in our hearts, how we trust them and how we find that we do things for them that make them feel loved and happy and what they do for us make us feel loved and happy. This whole area of self-fulfillment and bonding, all of the aspects of the heart should 
actually harmonize with how we think and how we look at things and how we use our heads. So, you know, we're, we'll, we'll get into this more, but it's, it's fun to just kind of start by saying most conflicts that people have in relationships, when you talk to them, you find that they have some kind of conflict between their head and their heart. They see things, they think about things that bother them, and yet their heart feels caught up in the in the relationship. And so they have this kind of pull. Yeah. Their sense of, of what they understand doesn't match with how they actually feel. Yes. And then, you know, before we begin, how did you even, um, was it just from, from counseling or what made you think like, or to notice that this is something seriously lacking, that people need this information? What, what made you think that, okay, I got to put this together in a book and then all the programs you now have based on that? Well, I think everybody, you know, I, I came from 25 years of, of doing private practice and I was right in the middle of that when I was uh, conceptualizing how to try to present something like a plan for singles on how to navigate a relationship in order to build a relationship that they feel confident about, that they feel like they're getting to know the right stuff about somebody and that they're actually involved in the pacing of the bonds of their heart. So even if you've never done counseling, even if you've just talked to friends or family members, almost all of us had had an experience of somebody who says one of two things. I wish I knew then what I know now, because in retrospect, when they look back, they see things that they should have explored. They should have taken more seriously. They should have thought a little more about. Yeah. And so the retrospective look makes them kind of reflect and say, "Ugh, if only I knew you know, back then what I can see clearly now, or people that did see issues and they just are so caught up in the relationship. They're like, you know, I know that he's got this issue or that issue. I know she's a little bit domineering here. I know she's kind of a control freak, but man, I just am, you know, so much in love. I, I, I feel really connected. We just get along so well. We do some, you know, we harmonize, we're so compatible whatever you fill in the blank, it just seemed like either they these patterns emerged where they were either not paying attention to key areas that they should and later on realize they should have, or they saw issues, but they just overrided them because the bonds of their heart caused them to minimize the judgment of their own minds. Yeah. And what you have, like that I know is when you talk about this RAM model, these things that are also, and I'm the one of like, oh, I wish I would have known this too. <laughs> um, and I don't know if we want to kind of jump in there, but it just, it makes like, it makes so much sense, you know? And um, it sort of goes back and forth between, you know, what you had said first about you get in, you're like, oh, there's some things like maybe I should have seen them. And what I really like about your book is you step-by-step -step go through like things that you might not, not even know you need to know kind of information too. Yeah, I think that, um, so I was in, in private practice at the time. I was also, as you had mentioned, teaching grad school in advanced uh, coursework of marriage and family. And th there was kind of this convergence of two things. So, um, you know, with all of those experiences kind of flooding me, First of all, I kept coming across research studies when I was teaching grad school that were just in an academic world, okay? But they were studies that I thought were really fascinating. And they were about what predicts success in marriage before marriage. Yeah. So some characteristics, some quality of, a, of an individual or a relationship before marriage that actually had very strong prediction of the outcome in marriage. And so that category of research I called premarital predictors of marriage success. Yeah. And I, I started wondering, well, I wonder how many research studies there actually are. So I began looking and I found literally hundreds of research studies that nobody had cataloged or organized. And so I, I did that. I organized them and they fell into five major categories that I call target areas to get to know, that if you get to know this specific area, research tells us this area is, a, is one of the strongest predictors of what 
a person will be like in marriage. And it, it predicts kind of like how your relationship will go. So I felt like that was so helpful to, to people in relationships, you know, right. We, Research kind of, backed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, people go by intuition and just their own sense of, you know, does it feel right? Does it not feel right? But they don't really have target areas of what to get to know typically. And I thought it was so empowering. Let's give singles key areas to get to know and operationalize it in very practical ways. So they even have like questions. So we came up with like 20 questions to um, help them explore each of these five areas. So around 9,900 questions. But the idea is, hey, if I know the right questions to ask and I know the right areas to explore, I all of a sudden have a, a way to, to use my head with my heart. Yeah. And I can navigate a relationship by bringing these topics up. That doesn't mean the first time you sit down with somebody, you'd be like, you know, pull out a list of a hundred <laughs> questions. Like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> before we order our appetizer, I have some questions about uh, your relationship with your mother. Right. You know, <laughs> <laughs> of course you can't do that. But if you, if you know the target areas and you have some, you know, key questions in mind, when times are fitting, they just happen naturally and they become deep conversations that many times never um, are explored by people when they don't have these areas. So they, they really generate great conversations that go both ways. Yeah, that's for sure. Well, and also too, in the beginning of relationships, and you know, there's something around, um, you know, we have like special chemicals that just make everybody just like look <laughs> super good, you know, and then that the whatever i guess that's the heart or the hormones that sort of take over that i think it's all part of the heart you know how <laughs> we're attracted our chemistry our hormones our you know all, all of that is very bonding and and that's what i call the heart so you know some people have said the head the heart and the hormones yeah um but um i just like to keep the hormones in the heart because i i, I really think we do we do we you know we do sex and uh relationships a disservice ultimately when we start pulling the sexual aspect of a relationship out of the heart and just make it some physical thing. It, that's not really what we know about brain science. Yeah. Uh, sexual attraction and definitely se sexual interaction creates chemicals in the brain that prompt bonding between people when there's skin to skin touch. And as far as I understand, almost always, there's some kind of skin to skin touch when sex is going on. So Yeah. Well, and that too, and you, you talk about that, like in one point of the book too, that a lot of people get themselves into when that, you know, part of that real model, when that goes too fast before you have these other things, that's when, and you know, and I can look in relationships in hindsight and see all this to be true as well. That's when stuff can go sideways where you either miss things that you should know that are highly important for a good long-term relationship, or you're just setting yourself up to be emotionally, you know, kind of wrecked. It's a really, really good point. So um, that's kind of the second. So the first area was the organizing and uh, of all the research that helped to identify these target areas of what to get to know. The, the second area was that, um, and you've made reference to this, is that I had developed a relationship attachment model that tried to identify, actually I did this uh, a number of years earlier, way back in the 1980s when I was doing my doctoral work. I, I said, you know, a, a relationship is how we connect with another person, but I didn't really find any theory and nothing real practical at all that helped to define the specific connectors or bonds that exist in relationships. Yeah. So I tried to take somewhat of a massive global look at all relationships and say, what are the major ways that we connect in all our relationships that can help people to visualize what's going on in that invisible world? Because if I can visualize it, if I can somehow portray it in my mind as to what is going on and the interaction between the major ways I am connecting or bonding with a person, it can also really empower me to be more involved in it, be more intentional about what I'm doing. So I, I can show you. Um, yeah, let's I talk have, about that. <laughs> I have a little example of it. I don't know if, if um, everyone can see it in the podcast. Yeah, I can see uh, it really well. In terms well. of an audio, we'll try to be very descriptive. But um, for this point uh, in, the, in the video, you can look at it and it, it just is 
like the old um, kind of in a recording studio where you have the mixing board, right? Yeah. That each of these um, five areas are like a slider that goes up and down. And, and by a slider, they're representing the strength of this bond or this connection. And so I'm going to start from the left and then I'm going to move to the right. So, I mean, technically there's no real order, but I think when we talk about building a new relationship, dating relationships, like things like this, there is somewhat of a logical sequence. Yeah. And so they are in just an order on the board and um, it makes sense then for a logical sequence. But in, in life and in experience, they just are all playing off each other and happening all simultaneously. So the first one on the left would be how well you know somebody or they know you. Mm -hmm. And so one, obviously you can't have a relationship if there isn't some sense of knowing another. Yeah. And so the slider going up and down represents the strength of how much you know about somebody. And this is a little more factual. You can think of it like you talk together, you share things, they're, they're realities about who you are that people get to know. And like I said, each one of these could be represented as a two-way street. I know you and you know me. Yeah. Now, knowing somebody is different than trusting them. Right. There are some people that we don't know very much, but we trust them a lot. So I put no down low and trust up pretty high. Um, you know, I just had some surgery not that long ago and I didn't know my doctor very well, but I, I sure trusted him a lot. Oh yeah. I <laughs> was wondering where that example was going to come from. That's a good one. <laughs> That's a good one. Right. Yeah. And plus the next one is rely. So rely is more like trust in action. So rely is how you are depending on someone to do something for you, how they meet your needs or they, you know, you meet their needs. Trust is more what you believe about them. So I, I actually did not know my surgeon very well, if we want to use that example, yeah. um, as a person, but I had a strong belief in his ability. I had heard some things. I'd read some things online. I talked to somebody else that had the same surgery. And when I you know, went into surgery, at that moment, my trust was being tested out in how much I relied on him. Mm -hmm. I was going to go to sleep, and he was going to take a knife and do his thing. And so... Man, my life is in your hands, dude. Uh, yeah. So, so no trust and rely. Well, in a in a dating relationship, when you meet somebody, uh, there's going to be things to get to know. There's going to be some kind of belief that you form about that person based on what you get to know, which gives you a sense of trust or confidence in them. And then as you interact, you kind of have a, like an exchange, something you do for them. Um, you're, you, you know, they do something for you, you, an act of thoughtfulness or kindness, or like, I can't remember, you know, you go out with them and somewhere in the, in the first, at the end of the first month, they do something and, and, um, you know, I don't know, buy, buy you your favorite candy. And you don't even, you didn't even realize that you had mentioned your favorite candy, but they picked up on it and they're like, yeah, yeah. You mentioned that, you know, milk duds were your favorite. And so I just brought some along for, thought it'd be fun for us. Yeah. And all of a sudden you realize they're really thoughtful. They're able to to pick up on little nuances and then, you know, but sociopaths can do that too. So you got to be careful. But yeah. anyway, <laughs> so um, no trust, rely would be the first three and then commit or your commitment is like your investment. So that's the fourth bond that exists in all relationships. How, how much of a priority this person is, how um, you kind of focus your life in on them. That's your commitment. Obviously we have certain relationships like marriage that, by definition, has some level of commitment. At least the institution historically has always had, you know, permanence has been kind of the concept with marriage. So commitment is not only somewhat of the definition of what you have in your relationship. It's a friendship. We're exclusive. We're engaged to be married. We're, we're married. What, whatever. There's, there's some level of commitment in some of these definitions, but there's commitment of the heart. How much I really vow and promise and, and make a priority of this person. And then the last, the fifth area is touch. And this can be obviously non-sexual. All our relationships um, have some kind of interaction where we physically express ourselves to the person. Our physical presence touches people's lives. Um, I'm getting to know you in a long distance way, but Hopefully sometime in the future we'll be physically present and we'll, it will be a much different kind of connection at that moment when you're actually even physically present. Yeah. 
And um, so uh, between parents and children, they know that touch is very bonding, but touch in a romantic relationship can also start to involve sexual attraction and chemistry and ultimately sexual contact. So know, trust, rely, commit, and touch. These five, I say, are part of all relationships. And when you think of a dating relationship, to put together uh, the content of my book, essentially, I said, there's a drop-down box under no. These are the five target areas I mentioned to get to know. We haven't said exactly what they are, but here are the key areas to get to know about somebody. And as you get to know them, just a, a basic, we call it the safe zone principle. Don't let a level get a whole lot higher than any to the left. Don't start trusting somebody way more than you know them. Yeah, that for sure. That's really <laughs> risky. Don't start looking to them to meet your needs. And people do this sometimes. These two levels can you know, go high really fast. They get into a relationship. They kind of drop all their activities and friends. They're now hyper-focused on that relationship with that person. And all their needs are kind of getting met in that bubble. And that can be very risky because their reliance or dependence has gone way higher than what they know or really can trust. And Lord knows this touch goes up really fast. I think the average for almost 20 years now, the average number of times that people go out before they start to engage in sex is anywhere from three to five times. Wow. And what I say is, you know, I, I'm not against sex. I just say, listen, realize that whenever, a, and whenever you do something in any of these five areas of bonding, that accelerate it, accelerate your trust in the person, accelerate your touch with the person. Anytime you do that, you will start generating a feeling of bond and connection with them that does not sync with what you're actually getting to know. And your head and your heart are not in harmony at that moment. And it becomes potentially very, very risky and very, for many people, it becomes very heartbreaking. As time goes on and they do get to know the person a little more and these areas like of trust come crashing down or they realize that they were very thoughtful in the first month or two, but that was just kind of their way of initially connecting with you and you cannot rely on them or depend on them. They're an undependable person and they, and they, you've given them your heart in many ways, but now your heart is being broken. Yeah. And you have, um, you have some good examples in the books too, about where that goes, where people just go up. And I, I think it's a one girl who just real fast, like likes this guy and then he moves in and then it, like, <laughs> <laughs> then it ends, it ends right there. And, um, you know, something to see, like before I even saw this or listened to you talk about that, you know, how those things go up and down and you might think like, oh, well, it's okay if you just do this or, or whatever, but, but really you're so right. If you're looking for any kind of like long-term relationship, when those things go out of sync, I think it really messes everything up. And to the fact of where I think in today, where we know very superficial things about people, we get tricked into thinking we know them. Like, oh, you're from California, I'm from California. We know each other. No, you're just both from California. You know, doesn't really mean you know the person. You're absolutely right. You know, I, I say in many ways we confuse know and trust. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I call it the three T's, time, talking, and togetherness. So of course you have to talk about things. Yeah. I say, there are like a, I called it a drop down box. So I, I, if you envision that no trust, rely, commit, touch model in your head, under no, if you think of a drop down box, I say there are five really important areas to talk about that actually are not being talked about very much or even thought about much in the majority of relationships that are formed in any kind of a romantic way nowadays. So I do think that they go very superficial, very shallow but we confuse know and trust. So we actually are not getting to know very much about a person, but we hear a couple things that just resonate with us. They just click. Yeah. We, I call it the click factor. Bam, that quickly they click and your belief in them goes up. But what it is, is that you form a picture in your mind of who this person is 
and you do what I call filling in all the gaps. Yeah. You, you actually only truly know a little bit, but it feels like you know them really, really well because in your mind, you have projected an image of who they are by filling in all the gaps. Oh, they're from California. Oh, that means that they're easy going. They're friendly. They love surfing. Oh, they're just like me. You know, they're, they're really into uh, sunshine and natural stuff and nothing ever really bothers them. And of course they have no temper because, you know, nobody out here is <laughs> which is just ridiculous. Yeah. But um, we have these stereotypes and we have these ideals. And as soon as we get to know a little bit, we sometimes make major leaps of faith in our minds in forming highly accelerated, I call them trust pictures of who that person is. And that then makes it feel safe to go farther in all the other areas of the relationship. I really think that accelerated trust and accelerated touch are the major um, trajectories or pathways that most relationships follow today and, and lead to lots of, of problems, lots of heartache, as I mentioned. And, you know, even when people are just trying to do this recreationally, I'm just going out for a good time. I don't want to think about anything. I don't want my head to be involved. I just want to drink a little, relax and have a good time. That pathway very often leads to bonds that actually tend to betray you. You feel bonded, but you feel betrayed because your head and heart are not working together. And so I, I do think that a lot of how we do relationships today are very, um, what would you say there? I, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's just terrible to say, but I think that the new normal is, is um, more hardship and dysfunction than it is um, beneficial for us in a lot of ways. For sure. I would completely agree that when you don't know these things, or even if you just like, and I'm sure I've had flippant attitudes before, like, oh, I'm just not interested, but you are. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't think there's, a, well, I mean, I can't speak for everybody, so I don't know what everybody thinks, but just the way that bonding and research shows works, it's it's maybe, I think, I don't know if it's a defense mechanism of like, well, in case I don't get hurt, I'm just going to go ahead and say I don't care, that type of thing. Or maybe there's, you know, whatever going on that you can engage. And I know I'm kind of circular, circularly going around that, but, um, but just want to agree that I think a lot of people have dysfaction, dissatisfaction in relationships today because they either don't know or are not following that model. And then there's a lot of projection where that trust goes up based on these, I mean, because I used to do this personally, like, oh, I know this person, like, they're an artist, and they went here, and they went there, and then I just decide all these things that I know that I don't really know. Yeah, I think um, what, what you're saying is, is so true for um, lots of our relationships. And so uh, a, couple, a couple things that just in general, I would say, and then maybe we'll talk about some of the areas to get to know that are specific areas that can be conversation you know, conversations and very helpful in predicting what a person would be like long term and help the judgment of the of the mind with um, the bonds of the heart. Yeah. So when it comes to relationships, I think going all the way back to the 60s and 70s. So I'm old enough to actually kind of remember those yeah. <laughs> decades, and they're not just uh, um, you know written in the history books of of rock and roll and so forth. But I I I think there was a there was a firm belief that began to set in motion that relationships, if they, if love in relationships, if it's healthy or if it's good, or if it's, if it's the right, you know, if it's right, it, it just runs itself. Mm -hmm. So the idea is, you know, if your relationship requires work, it's because there's a problem. If it is doing well, or if it's a good relationship, it doesn't require work and it runs itself so that people they, I think most of us get into relationships and just kind of like coast along. Yeah. And so we have a lot of sayings, you know, it is what it is, you know, what will be, will be. These sayings really seem to take intentionality and any personal involvement out of the mix and just treat it like it has its own engine driving itself, running itself. And that also means that if, if a relationship has a problem, it will correct itself. And if it doesn't correct itself, then it's probably something you should end and get out of. 
So I, I think this, this mentality about relationships minimizes personal involvement, personal responsibility, and having any kind of plan of how to, how to do relationships in, in healthy ways. Right. And as a result, people have lots of accidents. It's almost like saying the car will drive itself. Yeah. All you need to do, well, they are getting cars that drive themselves, <laughs> but, but not yet. So <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's just stick with the exit, what we have right now. But, yeah. you know, the idea of getting in a car and just assuming it's going to drive itself and you don't need any kind of involvement, obviously, is would lead to lots of accidents. But I think that's what's happening in a lot of our relationships. Yeah, that that it, like having, if you didn't have the pre-vetting and knowing all this stuff. How can you know? But yeah, let's go into what you're going into next, the good things to know. <laughs> sure. So um, I, I'm going to start with a real obvious, and that would be compatibility. <clears throat> so when you get into a relationship, and I think that's where I, I actually even start in, a, in, in the book, I have five chapters, one on each of these major areas to get to know, and then another five chapters on that those five areas of that relationship attachment model, mm -hmm. knowing, trusting, relying, committing, and touching. So um, one area is just compatibility. And so, of course, compatibility involves things like, well, if you go on eHarmony, it, 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 what is it, 29 factors or something? So mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't remember what it is anymore. It, it used to be 29 factors. Mm -hmm. And I, I would ask people when I was working with them, oh, you're going on eHarmony. That's great. You know, fine. Um can you name three of the 29 factors? And they're like, no, I took the test and it sent me a bunch of, you know, people that I'm like connecting with and things and trying to figure stuff out. But it, it's like, again, now the relationship is not the only thing that runs itself, but we can go on a dating website and the website will do all the work for us. Yeah. And um, so I say compatibility we can narrow it down to three major areas, personality, values, and lifestyle. And if people just think about those three areas, it starts to give them a very simple way to think about what, how does our personality click? Uh, what are the strengths? Because usually personalities are different in relationships, you know, but how does this person's personality click with my personality? Second, probably most importantly would be how are our values similar? Yeah. So personalities can be different, but values need to be similar. And then how do they live their life? You know, what are their goals, their dreams, their, um, how much emphasis do they put on work or education or what are they into? Um, are they, you know, spiritual or religious or, you know, what's going on with them in, in not only their lifestyle, but also in their heart values. And how does that connect with mine? The, those three areas make it easy. And if you just think, it's not just how we're similar, but it's in research, they call it complementarity. How do our differences actually blend in beneficial, mutually beneficial ways? Right. So complementarity, I think, is a really important part of kind of sorting through and thinking about when you think about compatibility. That might be one of the initial first things you see. Do we have chemistry? Is there attraction? Do we click? Do we, do our personalities have some sense of compatibility? Um, I, I, we've all talked to people where the conversation goes great, right? Uh -huh. And have you ever talked to a person where you get done talking and then they just stare at you and then they talk and you're like, wow, this is like, we are in two different speeds. You know, they're going at a slow speed and I'm going at a relatively medium to fast speed. And I, I, when they get ready to, to talk, by the time they're finished, I'm half asleep. Yeah. So that's not that's not clicking very well, obviously. You don't want to be in a long-term relationship with somebody that these things don't click. Yeah, and that's important from the get-go is like, don't you think is like, uh, you know, when you get those values, but even if a little bit of chemistry, or I guess I'll ask you this personally. So what if like, you're like, okay, our values are good. Like we get along, right? Like everything seems like straight and good, but like just chemistry, I'm just not feeling it. Do you think that's a no-go or do you think that people, what, what do you, where do you think chemistry lies in that scale? That's interesting. So, so um, I work with my oldest daughter. She's also a, a doctor, a PhD in, in psychology. And um, uh, 
we, we came up with the click factor and the ick factor. So, <laughs> you know, there's some people that you kind of get that little ick factor. And, and she said, you know, back when she she's married now with two kids and um, doing great in that in that stage of life. But back when she was dating guys, she said, you know, once you got that ick factor, it's all over, man. You, you just got to I don't know if that's true for everybody, but um, I, I guess I would say <clears throat> Marriage has been done a lot of different ways in different cultures. I mean, we have, a, for a long time, arranged marriages were the 80% of all cultures. And even in research about arranged marriages today, it's interesting, a number of arranged marriages seem to develop chemistry over time. Mm -hmm. So they were not arranged based on some sexual attraction and chemistry, but that did develop. So I don't want to rule that out that if you, if you have a really good relationship with somebody and you really fit well, but don't have all of the bells and whistles of chemistry, sometimes it's worth staying in that for a while. I know some people, they get chemistry. I call it really bad radar. They get chemistry with the worst dysfunctional people. I don't know why they're sexually turned on by somebody that is dysfunctional, but there are people like that, yeah. both men and women having that kind of attraction. And so sometimes the, the person that really has a great fit with you and is a much more healthy, well-functioning person doesn't, for that person especially, doesn't have that kind of a chemistry, but you need to sit in it for a while and see if it will develop. So um, now for me, when I met my wife, I, I met her in college and I didn't know anything about her. So if you think about that relationship attachment model, the no trust, rely, commit, touch, everything was low. But literally, as soon as I saw her, I, I mean, I had an immediate uh, attraction. <laughs> I was, mm. It was like, it, it was, it, it, I mean, that love at first sight, I mean, that happened to me. Now, yeah. As I got to know her, it, it's possible that she could have turned out to be a, a crazy, you know, and I, I would have uh, hopefully made a decision to get out of the relationship. But as I got to know her, I, I actually learned about her heart. I mean, I was attracted to her personality and her physique. And, but as I got to know her heart, it, I just admired her all the more and fell more deeply in love in a, in a head and heart way at right. that point. So I don't want to say that there is no such thing as chemistry developing over time. And I definitely would say that you can meet somebody and have immediate chemistry. And whether you act on it or not, that's just not a foolproof test, but right. you don't I've... need to act on it immediately. But certainly it becomes a, an, an important part, I think, of how a long-term relationship, it, it needs to be there for a long-term romantic relationship. Yeah. So any, anybody that you're going to seal the deal with, you better have chemistry, whether it started at the beginning or developed over time, it, it better be there in a very real way. Yeah. So if you're there in a couple of years and it's just, there's no chemistry, like, but everything else is good, probably not good for the long term. Probably not. Yeah. In a couple of years might be longer than what I would have given it. So uh -huh. I'm, I'm not, I, <laughs> I wouldn't stay in a really great relationship with somebody for a couple of years unless I'm in therapy and trying to like work out a lot of issues. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> Other than that, just for the normal course, you know. Um, what do you, what do you say, think is you know, a good point? Like well, uh, around I, rough, I that, rough I think time. A, so in the book, we talk about the 90 day probation period. Yeah. And that's I, really I, good. I, I really advocate, man, try to hold off on se the, your listeners will just roll their eyes, but I think people should hold off on sexual involvement and, um, and for at least, you know, three months because the getting to know process shifts when you're not sexually involved with somebody. Yeah. It shifts to what you talk about and what whether they're trustworthy or not and how you meet each other's needs. And it's much slower than we want it to really be. We want we want this process to go really fast. And three months really is a short period slow. of time in the grand scheme of things. You it's know what I mean? It's a short amount of time. Like if you're going to want to be with somebody for years and years and years and years and years, you know. I think three months and especially like for toxic personalities is a super good vetting you could it usually is. see through that. <laughs> and, and by the way, it isn't like all your levels of knowing them and trusting them, everything is at the, at the top at three months. 
what really happens somewhere in the third month is that two things. Number one, things that were not happening or not revealed, they were kind of the, the shadows of the person. They actually start to come out a little bit. You know, you, you've been going out with them for two months and you like them and, and you guys are, you know, taking it slow. But in two months, maybe no opportunity has happened for them to get angry at you. Can't you imagine that for yeah. yourself, you know, being in a relationship for a couple months and not doing anything to make the guy totally pissed off at you, right? That could happen, right? Sure. How yeah. important is it for you to see how somebody treats you when they're angry at you? Oh my gosh, highly important. <laughs> this is why this I is mean, why I tell everybody, yeah. get, you know, get, get the person pissed off at you on the first date. I mean, just let's get it out of the way, right? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's, I mean, because that's the truth. That's the other book I like, Domestic Violence is an Epidemic in the World and in This Country. And the level of, you know, anger or I think um, how they treat other people and uh, this might be, maybe you've touched upon this too, but it was in uh, Lundy Bancroft's book of if you watch like how they treat their parents and how the worst they treat other people is going to come back to you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And by the way, I was only kidding about getting them angry at you. Yeah. The, first, uh, <laughs> the first encounter. What I, what I am saying though, is you can't escape the necessity of time Right. In truly getting to know uh, the character of a person. So let's let's go beyond compatibility, which is an important area, because you keep going. This is, these are layered areas. You get the initial compatibility. Then as time goes on, you start seeing deeper and deeper. So let me give two other areas, and we'll kind of talk about them back and forth. Okay. How a person was raised. So what they took out of their family experiences, and then the the third area I'm going to mention is the maturity of their conscience. That's yeah. not conscious. That means you're awake. You know, you're alert. You're conscious of something. I'm talking about the conscience, C-O-N-S-C-I-E-N-C-E, -E, the conscience. And the conscience is both our, our internalized moral guide. It's that part of, of us that regulates how we practice our virtues and our sense of right and wrong, what makes us feel guilty when we apologize is usually because our conscience is speaking to us. So it also has a, an element of willpower. What I refrain from doing that I think is going to be hurtful to others or which I think is not appropriate or is wrong, my ability to practice self-restraint, all this is really uh, a major function of a faculty in the mind and heart of a person called the conscience. And I would also say empathy comes out of the conscience because my ability, my, you know, to, to see somebody and to think about life from their perspective, yeah. how they feel like, Hey, John, stop for a minute. Don't do this because if you do this, even though it's okay to, for you to do it, if you do it, it's going to really impact that person in a hurtful way. That ability to use the, the empathy and the care and the compassion of others as a standard of right and wrong in my mind. So I have my own sense of values. I have a moral code, but I also have the code of how it impacts others. Those two codes, my own personal moral code and the code of impacting others are the stuff of what the conscience uses. And people have different levels of maturity. And ultimately, yeah. <laughs> it is a huge predictor of how that person is going to be with you in a long-term relationship. Yeah. And we're like just about to like five minutes to the end. And so um, so do we want to talk about like your programs or other things or anything else you want to talk about as sure. we can kind of get ready to wrap up? Because it's just – you have just so much good information out there and accessible that – I mean, I think if you want to have a really a good worthwhile relationship, which I mean, makes a huge difference, like also in the health of your life long term, that's also research proven the people around you, you know, just knowing these things can make it, I think can just make the process just, I mean, easier, <laughs> uh, just so many good things. <laughs> so, I mean, first of all, um, you're going to uh, let them know that they can get uh, um, the book, uh, How to Avoid Falling in Love with a Jerk. This is what it looks like in paperback. You can get it right off of Amazon. 
Um, you can get it off of our website. Our primary website is Love Thinks. That's how the, the heart and the head work together. Mm -hmm. Love Thinks. But my Love Things has also lots of free resources. So if you just go to mylovethings.com, we have a ton of free resources you can sign up for at my love thinks um, on Instagram, uh, Dr. Morgan Cutlip, um, who, who is my daughter, I'm very proud of, and um, has phenomenal um, content that she pushes out every day about relationships. We also have the course Head Meets Heart, how the head and heart work together. It's an online course, goes through all this material. We have videos in that course, and that's also on My Love Thinks. So if, if you go to the website, mylovethinks.com, you can see these free resources. You can follow us on social media and get lots of, of good input on a daily basis. And you can get an online course that um, is a tremendous benefit for kind of personally sorting things through. I, I'll say it again. I think that we feel more confident and we feel more equipped for relationships when we have some kind of a plan. Yeah, for and sure. And the plan needs to, to be, how do we form the bonds of our heart? How do we kind of pace the way that we build trust? Or how do we pace reliance? Or how do we set a pace on how far we go in any kind of physical sexual aspect? And definitely what do we need to get to know about somebody? The head and the heart are designed to work together. And when we bring them together, in this kind of a plan, people just become way more confident, way more relaxed, and they enjoy relationships in much greater ways. Oh, I love that. And I'm going to put um, all of that information, all the websites in the show notes so that if you're done listening, you can look in the show notes and see how to access that. And, um, and your book's also on Audible too, for the Audible listeners. Um, and I just, I so appreciate you being on. This is just such great information because when you just fly blind in life and not pay attention, well, sometimes it's just crappy and you get what you get. But when you have more information, you can have better relationships. Yeah. Yep. We like to say we want everybody to learn how to follow their heart without losing their mind. Oh. And when we do that, it really... It just really starts to maximize our relationships in positive ways. And even if the relationship, by the way, doesn't work out, we don't leave it feeling burned and just, you know, like we just got dragged through the kind of like dragged through the mud of that relationship with lots of baggage. We leave feeling like, hey, you know, I, I made some good decisions. I set some good boundaries. I built the relationship in a healthy way. It didn't work out but I can take these positives out of it. So learning to follow your heart without losing your mind is really the ultimate goal of this whole uh, program, the whole book, and um, a lot of what we do here at uh, My Love Things. Well, thank you just so much for being on. And for all of you out there, you know that there is always another way. Mm -hmm.